Hello, lovely people. How is everybody? How's everyone doing? I can see your conversation about online healthcare stuff. That's interesting. I didn't know that Future Learn had any um, sort of healthcare things on there that you can do. So that's cool. Um, you could also think about trying to find some work experience doing, you know, those, those sort of like online or like text services to help people with um, who are having sort of like a mental health crisis and you can sort of do training remotely and do those. You could try those as well um, if you wanted to get some experience too. Uh, how's everybody doing? Is everyone enjoying the sunshine today? We'll get started in a minute or so. I'll just sort of wait for some more people to show up. Hey, Jalaj. Hi, me maker too. Hello, Irini. Is that how you pronounce that? Irini or Irini? Um, guide. Guide would be helpful. Stuck inside doing biology. Sorry. Yeah, it's pretty outside, but not everybody's going to be able to get outside. Hello, Katie. Hi, Manbeer. Hey, Charlotte. Hello, Lauren. Libby. Night hardcore. I should have stopped saying hello to everybody now. Um, but yes, let's get started. I will share the presentation with you. So my lovely colleague um, has dropped the PDF into the chat, just in case you guys want to follow along with the booklet. Um, hi, Dina. I shall share my screen with you. Watching pages from CFAX. I don't know what that is. Um, hi, Jasmine. Uh, can everybody see my most amazing dinosaur scientist? Is that all clear to everybody on the screen? Hey, T-Boy. Hey, Krisha. Yes? Cool. Perfect. All right. Let's get started then. So we're going to be looking at group seven today. And if you don't know me, um, because you haven't met before, welcome. My name is Georgia. Um, basically, the gist of this is that we should be um, going through exam questions that are sort of a mix of AQA, OCR and Edexcel exam questions around group seven, the halogens. Um, so I give you a little bit of time to do them, um, depending on how many marks they are. And then we talk about what the answer is and I answer any of your questions. So that's the gist. Um, please feel free to drop in a question at any time. Okay. So, uh, and at the end, then I sort of tell you a little bit about our online platform, which is sort of part of the reason that we sort of do these YouTube things to show you guys, uh, Snap Provise, um, and we give you a coupon for that uh, so that it's cheaper because he likes a discount. All right, so the first question is, which of the following describes the appearance of iodine under the stated conditions? So I picked this one specifically because last time there was an iodine question where lots of people were getting sort of very muddled between what iodine looks like in different states. So hopefully this will, will clear that up. Um, so I'm gonna give you a minute to decide whether it's A, B or C or D. Yes, there is also a D. So remember, hydrocarbon is something that contains carbon and hydrogen, whereas aqueous is something um, dissolved in water. So yes, iodine gas is purple, but gas isn't a, an option on here. Okay, I've had enough sort of answers in. The, the answer you should have um, 
is C. So most of you got that right. You should have shiny gray for solid. So if you guys want to have a Google of um, what iodine looks like, um, it's just sort of like this sh uh, shiny gray lump of a thing. And then you should know that it's brown um, in potassium iodide. Why is, what is brown? What bit's kind of the brown bit when it's sort of dissolved in aqueous potassium iodide? But isn't iodine a brown solid? No, it's sort of like a gray black solid. You're right that it's a solid uh, at room temperature, but it's sort of gray black. Um, brown when it's dissolved, purple when it's in a liquid hydrocarbon. So that would be something like um, uh, like butane sort of under pressure or something like that. Um, okay, moving forwards. So the next part of the question says, which of the following reactions is most likely to occur with chlorine in hot concentrated sodium hydroxide solution? So the clue is in the word hot. So let me know what you guys think. We have like a, a minute. What molecules do we need to know the appearance of? There's a bunch of different ones. You need to know, so you need to know your group two, depending on which exam board you are. So Edexcel needs to know group one, two, and seven, whereas the rest, uh, OCR and AQA only need to know group two and seven. So you need to know your appearances of your halogens in different states, and you need to know your appearances of different group two compounds in different states. This isn't for OCRA, right? Aha, yes, you're right. So OCRA won't have studied the hot version of this. So if you're OCRA and looking at that and freaking out, you will have only studied the cold version of this. But you can, by a process of elimination, figure out what it's definitely not if you're OCRA. So be, be aware of that. Tell me if you're OCRA, sort of add OCR next to it and tell me which one it's definitely not. So it's not the same as with cold alkali. So keep that in mind. I'm not entirely sure about the Cambridge spec. You'll have to check on your specification. Um, I only know that one specifically, Marvis, because I sort of taught this as a lesson the other day. Um, so I remember specifically what OCRA needed. Yes, for example, uh, Masimi, you need like the flame tests for group two like the flame test for magnesium and sodium and calcium and stuff. Not sorry, not sodium, magnesium and calcium. You definitely need the flame test. Okay, no idea what the answer is. Lucas says B, C or D. <laughs> um, that is correct, it's not A. So those of you that said A, that is the reaction with cold alkali. So if you have cold sodium hydroxide, that is the reaction you get. So that's your formation of bleach. You did, this is definitely on the AQA spec, Lucas. Um, so if you haven't learned it, you may just, it may have just been like left for the end of the year or something and you haven't quite covered it yet. Um, so NACLO is bleach and that first reaction is with cold alkali and it's how you make bleach. Um, the correct answer is C. So C is what we use with hot alkali. So hot NaOH. And that is, so NaClO3 is both bleach, but a sort of like a stronger bleach. And also you can use it as weed killer. Um, so you should have gotten C if you're uh, definitely, if you're AQA or if you're LXL, you should definitely be able to distinguish between hot alkali and cold alkali. So keep that in mind. Yes, this is on LXL, promise Libby. Um, Perhaps it's B for butterfly. Why B for butterfly? Although I do like butterflies. I saw a butterfly, there was a butterfly in my kitchen uh, yesterday. Sorry, that's completely irrelevant, but I've been thinking about butterflies. Uh, but it's no, it's not B. Why does it make a difference? Um, if you actually, is the next question about the difference? No, but there is a question that is sort of about the difference between the two, Thomas. So um, when we get to the question after next, 
remind me that I was going to answer your question, but we'll talk about it. Um, how do I know it's C? Charlotte, that's just something you have to memorize. Um, Thomas, when we get to not the next question, but the question after, remind me um, that I was going to explain that to you, but I want you to see that question first. Uh, are you too late? No, you're not too late. Um, we can't go back, but we can go, we can go forwards. Um, ah, I'm glad you like them, Georgia. And my name is also Georgia. So, you know, we also have the same name. Uh, okay, next question. So the next part of the question is when concentrate, <laughs> words, when concentrated sulfuric acid is added to solid sodium bromide, Bromine is produced um, when concentrated sulfuric acid is added to solid so sodium chloride. No chlorine is produced. The reason for this difference is what? A, B, C, or D? So if you're feeling like you haven't studied this reaction, you should still be able to work out the answer. So again, if you haven't come across this kind of reaction before, you should still be able to work out the answer. This has got some sort of basic chemistry rules in it. That you should know. Cool. I can see lots of you saying C um, and you are correct. And I'm going to sort of remind you why. So if we think about it in terms of just the half reactions, right? So if we think about sodium bromide, NABR, um, going to bromine, which is Br2, I'm going to get rid of my sodium because it's a... Um, a spectator ion. So if we're going from Br minus to Br2, what kind of reaction is that? Is that, um, someone tell me, what kind of reaction is that? Anybody? Yeah, it's an oxidation reaction. We're losing electrons. Um, and you guys should have seen that before in your studies of halogen. We're losing electrons. How many electrons are we losing? So obviously I need to balance this. I need two Br minuses, right? Because we're going to Br2. So how many electrons do I lose in total? Yeah, two. And I know this because my Br minus should have a, a redox state of minus one. And my Br2 should have an oxidation state of zero. So if there are two bromine Br minuses, then I have lost two electrons in total. So I know that my um, reaction going from bromine uh, ion, a bromine ion to a Br2 is an oxidation reaction. And if something itself is oxidized and it's in a redox reaction, what's it doing to something else? Yeah, it's reducing something else, right? Um, so if something is oxidized itself and it's in a redox reaction, it must be reducing something else, which makes bromine a reducing agent. And if bromine is able to go to Br2, but chlorine is not able to go to Cl2, then we know that it must be because C, the chloride ion, is a weaker reducing agent than the bromide ion. Does that make sense? Has anybody got any, so I will rephrase that. Does anyone have any questions before, before I move on? Is D true? Yes, bromine is less volatile, but it doesn't answer the question. So remember with our multiple choice questions, um, they're likely to give you several options in there that are true statements, but that don't answer the question to sort of try and make sure that you're not just sort of like reading through the list and being like, what is a true thing? You're actually reading and answering the question. Um, so, so halide ions become better reducing agents down the group, but halogens become weaker oxidizing agents 
down the group. So we've got oxidizing agents. So it's the ions that are reducing agents. Yes. Yes. Sorry. It took me a while to process your question, Jalaj. Yes. Um, would iodine be a stronger reducing agent? Does it go in order uh, of strength? Yes, there is a trend. So there's a trend down the periodic table where the bromide ions become better, um, oxy sorry, better reducing agents down the group. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Can I explain C because you're still slightly confused? Okay, cool. So the thing that I, um, the piece of knowledge that you were supposed to use in this question um, is the knowledge that sodium bromide is really just sort of BR minus in terms of reactivity. So NaBr we can think of as BR minus because it's, uh, it's an ionic bond and it's said that bromine is produced. So the thing that we needed to recognize is that is a redox reaction between our sulfuric acid and our sodium bromide producing bromine, we must have a redox reaction. And we know that the forward reaction for BR minus going to BR2 is, a is an oxidation because it's losing electrons, which means that it must have reduced the sulfuric acid um, and chlorine, which, would, which is supposed to react in the same way as bromine because they're both halogens, we're told it does not go to Cl2 which means that it was not successfully oxidized, which means that it did not reduce the sulfuric acid. Uh, so we know that a chloride ion is a weaker reducing agent than bromine. Um, I hope that helps Nassimi. So Katie says, does the state of an acid affect the strength of the acid? That's a really good question. It doesn't, it won't affect its pKa. Um, so there's two different measures of, of sort of acid strength, right? There's pKa, which is sort of like the uh, integral strength of the acid, sort of the, the thing that you can compare to anything else. Whereas pH is a measure sort of of the strength of a solution. So you could have a really strong acid that's really diluted, and then that would have quite a low pH, but its pKa would remain the same. Um, so, the state of the acid would affect the strength, right? Because if it's a gas, it's going to be more spread out. So it's technically a lower concentration if we're thinking of it in terms of concentration instead of pressure. Um, so pH would change, but the pKa would not. I hope that helps, Katie. But I'm going to move on. Um, are you going to learn about pKa in A-level chemistry? Yes. Technically, yes, Lucas, but also the solid will probably do quite a bad job at dissociating. So that would change for pKa is just, um, so Ka is the equilibrium constant for acids and pKa is minus uh, log to the base 10 of Ka. Um, so I'm gonna move on because this is a bit unrelated. So the next part of um, the question or the next part of this is uh, under different conditions, chlorine reacts differently with aqueous sodium hydroxide, which we saw um, earlier in sort of the third question. Uh, a disproportionation reaction takes place uh, as shown below. So we've got three moles of chlorine in its gaseous state, then six moles of sodium hydroxide, aqueous, five moles of um, sodium chloride are produced, which are also aqueous. And then we've got our um, sodium uh, chlorate, uh, aqueous and three moles of water. And it says that first we must state what is meant by disproportionation. And secondly, we must show that disproportionation has taken place in this reaction. Um, please use oxidation numbers in your answer and it's three marks. So I'm gonna let you guys have three minutes to just sort of have a stab at that. So remember, there's two parts to this question. You're stating what is meant by disproportionation and then you're showing that it's actually taken place using oxidation numbers. So remember to always be looking at your command words so you're not missing anything. You got about three minutes while I sort of sip my dwindling coffee.
you are not you are in a chemistry lesson as it says in the um description or more like a chemistry study session together kind of deal you got a, you got one more minute and then i will say things Okay, my love, please. Right, so most of you got the correct definition of disproportionation, which is excellent. Um, so what you should have said is something along the lines of disproportionation is the oxidation and reduction of the same element. So both are Fine. Um, so then the next part of the question um, is to sort of show that disproportionation is taking place, which of course means that we should probably write down our oxidation states. So the first thing we want to do is figure out the oxidation state of Cl2. So chlorine in Cl2 has an oxidation state um, that pretty much all of you have gotten is zero because it's an element. So it must have an oxidation state of zero. Um, and then we have chlorine in our NaCl in the products, which has an oxidation state of minus one, which pretty much all of you got as well. And then chlorine in our NaClO3 has an oxidation state of plus five, um, which most of you got as well. Um, so is disproportionation the same as a redox reaction? No. So a redox reaction, um, can be a disproportionation reaction, but disproportionation is a type of redox reaction. So a redox reaction is when um, oxidation and reduction take place in the same reaction, but it can be for different elements. Um, whereas disproportionation is when oxidation and re reduction happen, but it's of the same element. So as we're about to see, chlorine is both oxidized and reduced. So the first mark came from the definition. The second mark just came from stating all of the different oxidation states. And the third mark comes from saying um, Cl2 has been oxidized. to our plus five oxidation state in NaCl3 and reduced to minus one in our NaCl. So that's the last mark coming from actually explaining that it's oxidized and reduced. Um, could you say to the same atom? No, because it's not the same atom. An atom, remember what an atom is. An atom is just sort of one um, particle of that element. So you can't in one reaction be both oxidizing and reducing that same atom. It has to be the same element. Um, yes, I did say I was going to explain. So this is the hot, this is again the hot alkali question. So if we remember that both the hot alkali and the cold alkali uh, reactions are oxidation reactions, then what the heat does is it provides more energy for a further oxidation. So if you guys remember the cold alkali, I'm going to write the cold alkali reaction above still, and I'm not going to balance it. So forgive me for that still produces NaCl, but instead of NaClO3, it produces just NaClO, um, which means the oxidation state of the chlorine is not plus five. What's the oxidation state of the chlorine in NaClO? For chlorine. Yeah, it's just plus one. So, whoops, that's a five, plus one. So the heat, um, when you're reacting with sodium hydroxide, provides more energy to further oxidize the chlorine um, so to, it provides the energy to sort of strip more electrons away from the chlorine because that's what um, oxidation is. Whereas when it's cold, you don't have as much energy to oxidize the chlorine to the same extent. So it's just oxidized uh, a little bit. Does that make sense, Thomas? It's, yes, it's still a disproportionation reaction. Exactly, Kang. Thomas? 
Thomas, is that is that making sense now? Yes, no, maybe, or maybe there's lag and you've already replied. Yes, okay, cool, perfect. Ah, wicked, all right. Any more questions before I move on to our second to last question? Anybody? Nope. All right, I'll, I'll go back if a question pops. Ooh, question pops up. Okay, so is the cold reaction also disproportionation? Yes, it is. Um, why would you want to oxidize chlorine further? So NaClO3, the further oxidized chlorine, can be used as weed killer. So it's um, a lot sort of <laughs> more toxic. Whereas NaClO can only really be used as bleach. Both are bleaches, but the NaClO3 sort of is packs more of a punch. So it's weed killer as well. Um, what days and times do you do chemistry live? These are at three o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, okay, the next question. Does it get stronger as you gain more oxygen? So it becomes, so if it's been further oxidized, it becomes a better reducing agent. So that's what it's probably doing when it's killing weeds. Um, but I don't know the exact weed killing equation, so don't hold me to that, but that is a, a, an educated guess. Um, but it does become a better reducing agent. Okay, cool. Next question is explain why chlorine has a lower boiling point than bromine. So we've sort of come off the redox stuff a little bit and it's only two marks, so you've got two minutes. Tell me why. Why does chlorine have fewer, um, sorry, lower boiling points uh, than bromine? So remember you have to explain it you can't just sort of state trends, you have to explain the trends. I'm seeing some good answers, I'm seeing some slightly dodgy answers, it's a bit of a mix, I'm going to give you some a little while longer. Okay, cool. I feel like there's enough enough things in there. Yes, most of you are getting the, the gist beautifully. So the problem most of you had that is that you weren't answering the question. Those of you that did answer the question um, have done quite well. So we're explaining why. And the first thing we want to think about when we're thinking about boiling points of our halides, um, we know that they're not polar, right? If it's Cl2 or Br2, they're definitely not polar because it's the same element that can't be a different in electronegativity, difference in electronegativity. So as most of you said, um, the only kind of intermolecular force that you have um, in liquid chlorine or liquid bromine is either, sorry, I'm gonna list all the possible names. So van der Waals, if you wanna be sort of non-specific, but sometimes people use van der Waals, uh, London forces, London dispersion forces, or instantaneous induced dipole-dipole bonds, or just instantaneous dipole bonds, one of those, they're all the same thing kind of. Um, so that is the intermolecular force that's going to uh, determine our boiling point. Um, and the strength of those interactions depends on how many electron shells you have. So the, uh, the first mark comes from saying chlorine has fewer electron shells than bromine. And there are a few ways that you could have said that. Um, you could have said electron shells, you could have said it's smaller, you could have said a smaller atomic radius, you could have just said smaller electrons, uh, sorry, not smaller electrons, fewer electrons, you could have said it's a smaller molecule or some of their smaller atoms. Um, so anything is fine. 
induced dipole, um, yes, you would have had to say instantaneous induced dipole bond. Uh, so, so you need to say both, uh, both instantaneous and induced, but that's fine. So yes, so because chlorine has fewer electron shells, you basically can't get as big as a dipole, right? Because a dipole is sort of like how the electrons are distributed. So if you have less electron shells, then the sort of difference in distribution is not going to be as large. So chlorine has few, fewer electron shells than bromine. Um, and I'm just gonna just randomly use London forces because I think that's the easiest one to use. So the London forces between chlorine molecules are weaker than bromine. You could have also said that there are fewer London forces um, between chlorine molecules and bromine. So first mark, you want to talk about the electron shells. Second mark, you want to talk about um, the difference in strength of London forces. So remember that it's a comparative question, so you must compare chlorine and bromine. If you just said chlorine has um, few electron shells and weak intermolecular forces or weak London forces, you would not have gotten your marks. You have to compare chlorine and bromine. So please, please, please use the context of your question. Um, uh, I'm getting some questions in there. You've genuinely never heard of London forces, only van der Waals. Yes, different exam boards use different names. Um, different people use different names. Uh, it's one of those things that just has like the longest list of possible names. It's very annoying uh, to teach. Um, somebody said, how do you know whether to talk about intermolecular forces? Because if it was melting point, it would be about charge density. Okay, so I'm going to really quickly. Simple covalent molecules have intermolecular forces. That's what determines their boiling point because they're um, simple covalent molecules. So intermolecular forces are going to be what you're thinking about. Giant covalent lattices. That's going to be covalent bonds that you're talking about in terms of boiling and melting points. Ionic lattices and metallic bonds, whoops, are going to be about ionic bonding and metallic bonding respectively. Memorize that. Um, memorize that, please. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Where else was I? Do London people, do older people have stronger London forces inside them due to more electrons? Uh, not really, <laughs> Jalaj. Why do you think older people have more electrons? That doesn't, uh, that's not really quite how it works. Um, does it matter which word you use, London forces or van der Waals? Yes and no. So if your exam board specifically says van der Waals, use van der Waals, but keep in mind that van der Waals is actually an umbrella term for a bunch of different bonds. So lots of the exam boards say, no, please don't use van der Waals. Um, so just be look in your specification uh, and look specifically at what word they use and just use that. But I would say the best thing to use is probably um, London forces. It's the least confusing. Uh, yes. Scrolling, were there more? London forces are present between non-polar covalent molecules. Yes, so London forces are the only um, forces that non-polar small covalent molecules can do. Um, but that's not to say that polar molecules can't do London forces, they do. It's just the effect is so weak compared to the permanent dipoles or hydrogen bonding that it doesn't really do anything. LXL does not use van der Waals. So look in your specs. I am not going to sort of, I can't uh, look through all of your specs right now to find out exactly what language. Just literally Google your exam board with chemistry A-level specification and then do control F for the search function or command F if you're Mac and like literally search intermolecular and find the bit that says the intermolecular forces. It will take you a few seconds. Just try, just try that. Um, were there other questions? Don't think so. Scrollingy scrolling seems to be fine. I'm gonna move on. Van der Waals makes you comfortable. Um, 
yeah, so Van der Waals is the dodgy one, but also if you go and study chemistry at uni, lots of the old dogs will still be using Van der Waals. Um, so you will have learned that Van der Waals is bad because it's an umbrella term and then you'll get to uni and then everybody will be doing it. <laughs> so um, no, it's, no, it's just bad. Would you ever can do, consider doing short summary live videos? Um, what do you mean by short summary? And I'm gonna move forwards while Rini tells me uh, what uh, they mean by that. All right, old dogs. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know what a better way of putting it. People that sort of studied chemistry before the name change was um, applied. It's less, yeah, it is less safe. I, I don't know. Don't ask me why people use outdated names. They just do. I'm sure maybe in like, 30, 40 years time, I will be using outdated terms and not know it or not care. Um, so sorry. Are we doing videos on organics? Yes, check the live stream schedule. Um, that should be in there for some key concepts. So um, what we don't wanna do is kind of, um, we have videos on our YouTube channel for key concepts. So we kind of don't wanna like overlap with those, but yes, let's move on because I've been rambling for a while and we wanna get the last question done. Um, last the last question uh okay so the last question says the following pairs of compounds can be distinguished by simple test tube reactions for each pair give a suitable reagent that could be added separately to each compound to distinguish between them describe what you would observe in each case um so the first one we've got silver bromide and silver iodide so we want a reagent and what we can how that reagent will sort of tell us the difference between the two um so keep in mind that there are actually two options for this. You only really need to give me one of them, um, but it's three marks. So I want the reagent and our observations for both, please. So remember, you're trying to tell the difference between silver bromide and silver iodide, not the difference between bromine and iodine. Are oh, you having classes every day? So on YouTube, we just have 3 p.m. classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. On our platform, we have classes Monday to Thursdays for like three hours a day or two hours a day, depending on whether there's a YouTube class. Um, and I'll be telling you guys more about the platform in just a little bit. So a lot of you are just sort of saying the thing you remember about silver bromide and silver iodide. How do you tell the difference between them when they already have silver in them? Please keep in mind that they already have silver there. So adding another silver reagent is not going to tell you the difference between silver bromide and silver iodide. This is the point to make sure you're understanding what the question is asking you, not just sort of spitting out knowledge you have about silver bromide and silver iodide, so be careful. Exactly, Kang, yeah. Yes. So it's not asking you how you can tell the difference between them if you just look at them. Remember, it's asking you to add a reagent. It says for each pair, give a suitable reagent and that will allow you to distinguish and describe what you observe. So if you're just putting down how you can tell the difference by looking at them, you would not get your marks. You have to add something. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go for it now. So please read the question, people. Don't just sort of say what you know about that topic. You must read the question properly and make sure you're answering it. So the, you, we had two choices of reagents. So most of you gave the first one. And the first choice was concentrated ammonia. Um, concentrated ammonia um, is added because they have different solubilities in concentrated ammonia. If you put dilute ammonia, you would not have gained your marks because neither of them dissolve in dilute ammonia. Um, so our silver bromide dissolves. 
So it will dissolve in ammonia. Whereas our silver iodide, there will be no change because it does not dissolve in ammonia. Um, so please be careful of that. There was, another op there was another option for what you could have said. Um, and this one, I find people ha sort of haven't heard of before, but it's in the mark scheme. So I'm gonna tell you about it anyway, just in case um, it comes up on its own. Um, so you could have also added concentrated, uh, yes, you could have said colorless solution. Why doesn't um, silver iodide dissolve? Um, it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that iodine is really big. Um, so things dissolve when their ions can sort of separate from each other and be surrounded by the solute, um, sorry, the solvent. So if they can't do that, it suggests that their bond is stronger than the sort of the soluting, solventing, not a word, I'm gonna use it anyway, solventing power of the solvent. Um, anyway, so you could have used hydrochloric acid um, because hydrochloric acid would do a substitution reaction with the with the silver. So it's not like this is a specific test. It's just a, the knowledge that your um, sulfate group will do a substitution reaction with your halides. So you would get silver sulfate um, for both. So if you get silver sulfate, then you sort of, you don't have um, silver bromide anymore. You just have your bromine in solution. So what color is the bromine in solution? Anybody? Bromine in solution, what color would that be? Yeah, brown. How do you know that it's not asking for the precipitate? It's exactly what the question is asking. It says that you need to add, it said give a suitable reagent that could be added separately to each compound to distinguish. So you have to read the question and it says give a reagent. So just looking at them, looking at their precipitates, um, that's not giving a reagent. So you have to give a reagent. Um, I'm gonna, okay, so if we'd kicked out, if we'd done a substitution reaction with H2SO4 and uh, silver bromide, we would have gotten a brown solution. And if we'd kicked out um, iodine from the silver iodide, what does the iodine look like in solute? What would happen to the solution if iodine started reforming? Anybody? What would the iodine look like? Yeah, we'd either get like a gray black solid forming or we get a purple gas coming off the solution. Um, Jalaj, I am not gonna give my birthday because I don't wanna sort of have personal information on YouTube. Um, that's too personal. Um, okay. Last question. So the last question, again, if we remember to read the question, we have to give a suitable reagent um, that could be added separately to each compound to allow us to distinguish between them. And then we wanna write our observations. Um, so we have HCl and nitric acid. Um, what could we add to HCl and nitric acid that would allow us to tell the difference between the two? No worries, Jalaj. Um, it's just sort of important for me to keep YouTube life separate from life life. So if you've given me a reagent, then I'm gonna need your observations also. What will the observations be? Got about a minute and then I'm going to tell you. Confused about part B. So these questions specifically are asking you things you know, but a bit out of your usual context. So I want you to think carefully about what you know about testing for these compounds and how you might apply that. Mm. 
Yeah, exactly. So most of you sort of recognize that you can test for HCL specifically with um, the compound that a lot of you were telling me for part A with our silver nitrate, right? You can test for the Cl minus um, ions using silver nitrate. And lots of you said um, white precipitate, which is correct. If you just put a precipitate, that's not enough. You need to say a white precipitate because that's the observation that you're supposed to remember. So that's the first bit. Um, if you added silver nitrate to um, nitric acid, like not much would happen. There would be no change. It doesn't need to be acidified Kang because it's, it is it's hydrochloric acid, right? So it's already acidified. But that's a good, good shout to remember that that could be the case. Okay, I'm going to finish off there and do that thing that I do at the end of all of these is tell you about our cool website. <laughs> cool for, um, uh, you know, thingies, uh, nerds like me and hopefully you, because I think nerddom is the best kind of thing. Um, all right. So talking about our nice website, um, the reason that we do these uh, YouTube videos is often um, a lot about, can I please do Hess's Law next? We have the schedule up. Hess's Law is on there, I think. I believe it's on there, or we may have already done Hess's law. I can't remember if we, if maybe looking back next, um, but the previous ones, um, why no change? Because both of them are ionic, right? The H plus and the NO3 and the AG and the NO3. So basically they're just sort of there in solution together. Nothing happens. Um, all right. And then I was going to show you our nice website, unless you've seen it before, in which case, you know, you don't have to stay, but, or you can just hang out with me for a bit longer while I talk about Snap Revise, which is obviously uh, awesome. Uh, see you at four. Um, bum, bum. Okay, sharing my screen with you so that you can see the wonder that is the Snap Revise website. Uh, yes, Jalaj is a wonderful student of mine um, online on our platform, which is why I know her name. And I apologize, Jalaj, if you did not want other people to know your name. Um, but yes, so this is our website. Um, so it's cool because you can sort of pick your exam board and pick your subject. And then we will basically like take you through the whole course in lots of different cool ways. Um, so for example, let's say you wanted to know about the properties of period three. Um, we would first do a diagnostic quiz with you so that we knew what you sort of got right and got wrong. Um, and then there are a bunch of videos uh, that you can sort of skip through to the bits you don't understand. If you can't be bothered to watch like the introduction, we've got nice chopped up videos so you could jump straight to melting point if you wanted to. Uh, and then do another quiz to see whether you understand um, sort of what's going on in the videos and then sort of exam question run throughs so that you understand what the questions will start to look like when you hit your exam. So that's cool. So that's sort of a part of our basic package um, so that you will get no matter what you do. And then if you sort of upgrade to the pro package, you have a, like a ton of exam questions that we've created for you. Um, so you run through them, you can have a go and then have a look at the solutions to make sure that you've gotten them right. Um, which is perfect. Uh, and then we sort of gamify it so you can see how well you're doing study wise, um, sort of a combination of like things that you've gotten right and uh, how often you study. So you sort of know where you're at. Um, and then last but not least, um, if you upgrade to the ultimate package, you get me um, as your <laughs> as your teacher. Uh, and I run web classes. So in like 10 minutes, I'll be sort of doing a recap class on mass spec. Um, and then there's sort of, drop-in sessions where you can come in and sort of ask any questions you have or go through any exam questions you feel unsure about. Um, we've just done, we do a ton of those. Those happen like every day, Monday to Thursday. So basically we've sort of tried to create a platform that does everything that you might need to get through your A-levels. Um, how can you join the book club? Yes, and we have a book club running at the moment. Uh, you have to sort of be in our ultimate package to be in the book club. So I'm afraid there's not really a way to join the book club without subscribing um, to everything else. Does it work on lots of devices? Yes, it does. It works on iOS, iOS and Safari. 
Um, I thought you were going to do the green chemistry thing today. Yes. So as I said in the drop in July, we I decided that because um, we have sort of a lot we can do with green chemistry to sort of take an entire less the lesson for next week on that. So on Tuesday at four, we'll do the green chemistry. And then also there's leftover stuff from the year 13 class on Wednesday that we'll do at four instead of doing a new one. Um, so I just sort of decided to do that because both year 12 and 13 ran over this week. Uh, so we're going to do that. Um, but yes, so that is our that is our platform. Um, it depends on which package you get. If my colleague could possibly drop in the web page for the different packages, um, then you can see uh, how much each cost. Um, but yes, I'm going to finish off now. Um, what is that? The, the book club is the book club that we run on the platform. Um, thank you, uh, lovely colleague that has now dropped in the um, different pricing for all the different plans. I'm going to go because I have to set up for the next lesson. Oh gosh, my discount coupon. <laughs> like literally every time I forget to give you guys the discount coupon. Um, apologies. I will share the discount coupon before I go. Um, and then you can have a nice discount. Oh, and don't forget you can set like alarms for these study sessions so that you don't miss any. Um, and then here is your coupon code. What's the book club like? Um, well, I can tell you what it's like from my perspective. At the moment, we're reading a book on sort of an introduction to quantum mechanics, um, which some people love quantum mechanics, some people hate quantum mechanics. So it's really like sort of depending on whether that's your interest. And then after that, we'll probably read a book kind of a little bit more on the organic side um, so that we have both sides, like physical chemistry and organic chemistry. Uh, but yes, so I really enjoy the book club. <laughs> But um, you might want to ask, I'm not sure how many of my students that are in the book club are in this chat. Uh, but yes. Okay, I'm going to go. When's the next chem session? On Tuesday at four. Uh, check the schedule on, our, on the YouTube channel. Bye, lovely people. Have a lovely afternoon. Um, and I'll see you on Tuesday at three, if you're back.